Welcome to Profoundly Human. Matthew Warner is a pioneer in the area of church communications, a husband, a father, an entrepreneur, and an employer. He is the founder of Flocknote and the author of Foolish and Messy, How to Make a Mess, Be a Fool, and Evangelize the World. It's an outstanding book. He's an extraordinary man. And I recently had the chance to sit down with him here in the studio for a conversation. I hope it enriches your life the way it enriched mine. Hi, I'm Matthew Kelly, and welcome to Profoundly Human. Today, I'm sitting down with Matthew Warner. Great to be with you. It's fantastic to be here, man. Welcome to Cincinnati. Thank you. Yeah, it's good to be here. Important questions to start with. Um, are you a coffee drinker? <laughs> I am a coffee drinker. I, di I didn't grow up a coffee drinker. Actually, it wasn't until I was an adult that I started drinking coffee, and that was mostly because of my wife. And uh, so I'm not your normal coffee drinker that has to have coffee or a certain amount of coffee every day. Uh, I'm usually fine if I don't have it. But for me, it's more of a a ritual now. So it's part of sitting down with my wife and uh, we usually every morning sit down and have a cup of coffee together and it's a great way to start the day together. And um, so yeah, for me, it's more of that ritual of slowing down and enjoying something or company or something else. Yeah. So um, that sounds like a very ideally peaceful thing, sitting down with your wife in the morning to uh, have a cup of coffee. But I'm, I know that you have six children <laughs> under the age of 13 and you run a business with, you know, 40 employees. And uh, so how does that work? Yeah, good question. Um, not very often, <laughs> but <laughs> it, uh, well, I say it, it works, um, just doesn't maybe work as peacefully as it sounded when I said it. Uh, but we, we do pretty much every day do that. Um, if we're in a good routine and we're up early before the kids get up, then that's, that's the best way to do it, um, where we can greet them as they start the day. But, but more often than not, probably they're the ones waking us up or they're up early running around the house. So it's a little more hectic, but, but we still manage to do it. We try to have brereakfast as a family. Um, now that the kids are a little older, some of them can make their own breakfast. And so that's nice. Awesome. And you can sit down and enjoy yours and, and a cup of coffee. What about food? What is your favorite food? Favorite food. So I like a lot of different kinds of foods. I think the food I love the best is the stuff when you prepare it yourself. So whatever that is, and especially if you've grown it yourself or raised it yourself, um, which we try to do a little bit in our house. And um, there's just a different level of um, gratitude and enjoyment. It always tastes better if you grow it yourself and you put the work in, of course. Um, and I think, uh, um, the cultural dimension of food is always really interesting to me. So I think it's, there's a tendency today to reduce it to just the nutrition into my body or the calories I need or something that makes my mouth happy. But um, I think including the cultural dimension of it and the, the occasion you might be having it for, the preparation that goes into it um, and inspires like a really healthy gratitude and appreciation for it that I love. So that's, that's the food I love best. Now you mentioned the um, growing it yourself and I, I was rereading your book last night, and uh, one of the things in your bio, your bio ends with um, Matthew, his wife, and their children hang their hats in Texas, where they aspire to be simple farmers and good neighbors. What is the extent of the farming? <laughs> As, uh, yeah, aspires is a key word there. Uh, it's a journey for sure. Um, we've made quite a bit of progress since then, actually. So we've got um, lots of chickens. Um, which we'll raise for meat and for eggs. Uh, we've got ducks, we've got pigs now, we've got um, beehives. Uh, we're putting in a fish pond and stocking that with fish right now, which is really exciting. So uh, we do a lot of uh, vegetable gardening as well. So it's a, it's in sort of fits and starts sometimes like uh, getting it going and there's seasons where it's great and there's seasons where you know life gets busy with the kids or work and things like that. So we're trying to gradually transition to where it's more um, consistent part of our life, but, um, but we're doing a pretty good job now and, and really enjoy it. What attracted you to that or what is the ethos or philosophy behind that for you? I guess I, I'm an idealist and to me, farming is such an ideal kind of way to work. Um, it provides for so many needs, but it's also a kind of work that is physically healthy, you know, done in you know certain ways. Um, so you're not sitting in a desk all day and, and you know, doing unhealthy activity. So it, it takes care of like your physical activity being healthy, you're raising healthy food, it inspires that kind of gratitude. Um, it's work that you can do 
with your family, which I love. Um, so much of what I do now, my work is at a computer in an office, you know, and, yep. and I love getting to work with my kids and with my wife and doing that together. And so farming and gardening is a really fun way to do that. You can do it across all different ages. You know, our one year olds out toddling around chasing a chicken and, you know, the 13 year olds feeding pigs and, you know, we're digging weeds in the garden or whatever. And um, it's something you can all do together. So I love that part of it. And I think I just, I love being out in nature. You know, there's something about, I love cities. I love technology. I have a technology company. Um, but you know, when you're surrounded by it all the time, it, you have this tendency to sort of say, Oh, look how clever we are as humans. And, um, you know, when you're out in nature, it's, it's a different response. It's a, it's one of just gratitude and awe and wonder at God, at the creator. That's something I could never do. And, um, so th there's just a, it's a, it's a wonderful place to be. And I feel like spending more time out there has just been really good for our family, really good for our kids. Um, keeps us active, um, use your hands, um, to make things and do things. And so it's such a good balance, I think, to, um, so much, so many other parts of our lives, mine included, that is spent a lot of time on a computer or in an office or at a screen or things like that. Got it. What about favorite movie? Gladiator. Gladiator. Sure. Gladiator. Russell Crowe, great Australian. <laughs> yeah, yep. Um, yeah, it's just, I still think it's the best epic style film. Um, and it's just got so many good themes to it. Of course, the what we do um, here echoes in eternity. You know, what we do in life echoes in eternity is just sort of great central message to it. Um, but it's also a story of a farmer, um, which most people don't think about. It was the farmer who became a general and a general who became a slave and a slave who became a gladiator and a gladiator who defied an emperor. Um, but it was that it, it starts, uh, you know, with him already in battle as a general, but he was a farmer who left his life, his comfortable life, kind of like Bilbo, you know, leaving in the Hobbit, you know, where he's called out of his comfortable shire and, um, you know, called to some great adventure that, that, you know, Providence has him on. And, um, you know, it was similar here and his, his, uh, of course, a, a man of virtue and he grows in virtue throughout the movie, but, um, just so many good themes. And, uh, uh, I like the power dynamics of sort of government and the mob and the mob rule. And, um, you just see that full on display there, but it's applies to every social group, um, government, whatever it is, you know, of the, you know, the influence of the mob but then the power to control the mob being, you know, how you're able to gain power in so many different ways. So, um, yeah, so many good elements to it. Mm. Still my favorite. Great movie. What is happening in your life at the moment that you're excited about? Well, flock note, um, is continuing to grow really quickly. So that's our, uh, software that we build for parishes and churches around the world to uh, communicate better and, um, manage their relationships with their members and grow their flock and evangelize and do all these meaningful things. So that continues to be a really meaningful part of my life and a challenge that God's called me to, to figure out how to manage the growth of that and do it um, continually better. Uh, but certainly right now, my kids are at those ages where you feel like time's just flying by and they're growing up so fast. So I continually am just trying to focus on being present and just not, um, not missing a moment and not wasting it. So there's a lot of emphasis on that, spending time with the, with the family, doing projects together, doing work together um, with the kids uh, during these really precious years. So the, the children obviously a big part of your life at this moment. How is fatherhood different to what you expected? Hmm. It's a good question. I don't know how much I thought about it beforehand. I mean, it's so different, um, certainly hard, uh, but I think I've grown to appreciate just how helpful marriage and children are to just, um, becoming more virtuous, <laughs> how important they are to that. Um, as humans without it, I, I admire people that can do it without having those kind of challenges in your life that are just demands that are, you can't, um, you can't choose not to take care of, you know? So in that sense, it makes it less virtuous, I guess, cause I have to do it, but, um, but growing in virtue through just serving your kids and taking care of them and their needs, um, you know, has been a, a great, uh, blessing, very difficult. Um, 
but and it continually forces you to reprioritize your life. You know, you can't do everything you want to do and you realize your limits really quickly. And so you have to really discern what's important and say no to the rest. Yeah. And that's, that's a difficult thing. What was your childhood like? I had a great childhood, um, wonderful family, uh, amazing parents, hardest workers I know. Um, you know, I think uh, I remember growing up with a lot of imaginative play, imagining I was a ninja in the woods and, you know, <laughs> all those things kids do. Uh, I feel like I had a really good childhood in that sense. Um, I loved music. We always had lots of music playing in the house. Uh, my parents are very musical, so that was a big part of my life, too. I really got into that later on. Um, we were a big do-it-yourself family, so my my mom's very, very good at anything crafty, so she's always doing artistic things and making things, um, different crafts, and we got to do those with her, and my dad was always a preferred to do things himself and build things himself, and so we were always working on some big project as a family, um, building an addition to the house or a garage or fences or you know whatever the, the case may be, so, um, but that was, I really appreciated that in retrospect, um, the time we got to spend working together on those things and learning how to work hard, learning um, to appreciate you know, the effort that goes into things. When you're parenting on a day-to-day -day basis, do your parents, uh, how do your parents influence that? How do you see them in, in your parenting? Um, my dad is, a, a, I think, a great example of what I want to be as a man in terms of being uh, strong and tough, but having uh, such a soft, gentle heart, you know, so that's something I think about a lot is trying to be both gentle and strong as a man. Um, and he's a great example of that. And, uh, you know, my mom, the word that comes to mind most is just service. She's just such a servant. Um, she is just always taking care of other people. And, um, uh, she's, yeah, she's volunteering. She's, very active now, um, now that she doesn't have to take care of her kids directly anymore. Um, you know, she's taking care of nuns and elderly in the, in the, in the, uh, you know, retirement homes or wherever, you know, that are lonely and don't get to get out as much and things like that. That's just how she spends her day. And when they see her, they just light up, you know? And, um, so that seeing the value and, and gift that is to people when you can be that kind of person, um, definitely learn that from her. And I'm always inspired by that. Obviously, you're, you're a pioneer of technology for churches. When you started Flocknote, you first started going to churches and saying, hey, I've got this idea, you should do this. What do you remember about that? <laughs> well, so this was when I first started doing this. Um, so maybe it was before Flocknote. It was something that I started before Flocknote and kind of turned into Flocknote. But I was still an engineer at Lockheed Martin at the time, and but had gotten really passionate about uh, my faith and and entrepreneurially minded, and um, so I was wanting to do something. And yes, started coming up with tools that I could use for for um, to help the help parishes better reach their people and communicate uh, what they need to communicate. And um, certainly when you first approach them, this was the time, 2008, 2000, 2007, 2008, 2009, um, you know, Facebook groups had just started, but MySpace was probably still slightly more popular than Facebook was when we first started. So it was that kind of era, but everything was free. So the new model was, you know, advertising based, free um, software. And um, so the expectation too for them was that everything would be free. So getting them to pay anything was very difficult. They didn't have a really a software budget in those days. They might've had some database tool they used in the back end, you know, but for the most part, they spent, you know, way more on donuts each week than they do on software tools, you know, software tools that would help them in these ways. So it was really creating a new market in a sense, you know, especially the software as a service model um, was very early. And um, so it took a lot of work at first um, to just convince them that this was valuable, that it's something that is worth paying for, that you're going to get more value out of it than you're going to pay into it. And um, it took years to kind of work on that and and create the market almost. Uh, but um, it was worth it. And it was a problem I was really passionate about solving. So stuck with it. At what point did you realize this is going to work? 
Well, there's something about the moment somebody first pays you to do something yeah. and, and, and then they keep paying you and you go, okay, we did something that works, which is an important lesson for entrepreneurs. <laughs> it's an important moment, I think, when you create something that's really valuable and people agreed it was valuable. It wasn't just something you thought was a good idea. Um, so that moment, and then it's just a matter of multiplying it, you know, which is another problem to solve, but you know, it's, it's, it's possible. Um, so that happened very early on, but, but it wasn't for, for many years, we were so small that I always assumed that, you know, some big player, some big company would come in and just copy what we were doing and, and then steal all the business and we wouldn't make it. Um, cause we were bootstrapped, you know, through the way, all the way through really. And, um, and, uh, just grew at the pace we could grow based on the clients we were getting. And um, that was very slow at first, you know, and it kind of snowballs um, over the years and gets more and more and more, which was fantastic. But early on, we were very limited in resources. I was by myself for the first three years. Um, and my wife was still working at the time at her job. She's a, a, a writer at a, a marketing agency. And um, we had had two kids. So I was at home with two babies and trying to run the company. And, you know, I was the programmer and the support and the sales. Um, all by myself. And, um, you know, it, it uh, definitely was in question all those years of whether this would really work or not. Um, but I was very, I knew that it was a problem that needed solving. And I knew it was worth solving. And so I figured if I stuck at it long enough that it would work. And um, turned out that it worked. Um, and it just, it, it was just a lot slower than you think, you know, you expect it to kind of go a lot faster and it's just grinding it out year after year, a little bit more, a little bit more, um, until again, you kind of, um, 10 years later, you're looking at it and it's like, wow, okay, we made it, you know? So it was, it took four or five years before I was like, okay, like I feel really good about this, but we were still very tight. You know, we were always spending money as soon as we got it. Um, or, you know, if we knew we were going to get it next month, we were spending it now, you know, um, but it wasn't until, you know, probably eight, nine, 10 years into it, you know, where it was like, okay, this was all worth it. You know, this was worth not saving as much money as I should have for a long time and, um, quitting my job and not making anything for many years and all those kinds of things. Um, it was finally, you know, worth it in that. And mostly because it was really helping, helping churches do something really, um, significant in the world. So when you decide to quit your job at Lockheed Martin, uh, what did the people around you, what did the people in your life think about that life choice? I think most of them, I mean, I think it was something none of them would have done. Not many of them would have done. You know, I think it was, it was a, it's a really good job, great company, great people I was working with. And I really enjoyed the people I worked with there. And even a lot of the work I did was really interesting <laughs> stuff. Um, and very challenging, but yeah, at the time, the idea that you would, uh, quit your job when you have that great of a job, um, just most, we're just taught that that's not something you do, you know, until you got the next thing lined up for, you know, you know, you do the responsible thing. So it was definitely a leap of faith in that sense. And, um, but you know, you, you, uh, it was, and it was also right after I got married. So that was another dynamic that was interesting. <laughs> Because essentially I was working, you know, 50 hour a week at, at Lockheed Martin. And then I'd come home and I'd work 30 hours a week on this other, you know, project. And once I got married, my wife was like, you know, I want to actually spend time with you. So I need you to just, why don't you quit your job? <laughs> and luckily she was, she was such a blessing and, and very supportive. And she's the one that told me to do it. Um, she's like, you need to just do this full time and give it a shot. Um, but it was a good lesson to think through. A lot of times I think we we kind of don't take risks because we don't define them very well. And they remain these ambiguous things you just never do, or that's too risky. Um, but you know, when you define out, well, what's the worst that really happened, you know? And when I told the people I was leaving Lockheed, they were like, well, if you, if you want to come back, just let us know. I'm like, okay, <laughs> it's good to know, right? You can, you can get another job one day. Um, but what's the worst that happens? You know, it fails and I got to find another job. Luckily I'd saved a lot of money up to that point and been smart and with, with financially and all that and didn't have any debt. And, um, you know, my wife was working at the time. So I mean, all those things came together as a, as a huge blessing for us to make it possible. Um, but when you add all that up, you go, it's really not that risky. You know, it seems crazy to a lot of people, but it's not, 
And, um, and people also sort of, uh, there's a, there's a, a bias built into what you're already doing that, that you think there's no risk to it just because it's the status quo. But, you know, people get laid off from jobs all the time. There's risk staying where you're at, you know, and so you, you got to remember that too. Um, it's not a choice between no risk and risk. It's two different types of risks and, and making those decisions. But, but no, it was, it was, it was a little challenging, but I had a lot of support. Some great insights there. What, um, so today Flocknote serves, uh, 10,000 churches, mm -hmm. about 40 employees. Uh, what is the most satisfying part of that? The people I get to work with for sure. Um, definitely the core passion for me was to help, help the church get the message out. I mean, that was something that I realized in my generation, people falling away from the church and they didn't know what they were leaving and it hadn't been communicated to them what they were leaving. And so for me, that was just at the heart of this thing. But then it was also just practical things. Like I was getting more and more involved at my own parish and they just couldn't tell people that stuff was happening. They were doing a lot of great things, but they just weren't telling anybody about it. Or they didn't have a means to just get the message directly to their people like they needed to. So that seemed like a pretty straightforward problem to try to solve. And um, that's where we tackled it from. So certainly the core, that core passion of solving the church's problem, that continues to be very satisfying, you know, and we're continuing to make a huge impact, a bigger and bigger impact in the church. Um, inside the Catholic Church and outside the Catholic Church, uh, and just helping people build their flocks, build relationships with their in their communities, and spread the gospel and go after that lost sheep, which is sort of core to our mission at Flocknote. Um, but secondarily to that, over time, my passion for building a great company has has equaled that at least, and um, I just get to work with the uh, the most amazing people, and I think we've you know, God's blessed us with this amazing mission together and just the friendships that we build as a team um, to see these people blossom um, into, you know, just what their potential is, I think, which is just so great. Um, it's just so rewarding. And, and we've continued something I got very passionate about was employee ownership. Um, and, uh, you know, within, our market, as most software as a service markets are right now, there's a lot of investment and acquisitions and all that stuff. And, and there's good parts of that. And there's been some negative effects of that, I think, too, in the church space. Um, but it was just something I became more and more passionate about was um, I, I love Chesterton. I love distributism. I love the idea that society works better when property is more widely distributed in general. And um, so... And I love Catholic social teaching on this, um, the encyclical by Pope Leo XIII. Um, Reverend of Aram speaks a lot about the rights of worker and this relationship, the uh, rights of labor and wor workers, and um, this relationship between capital and labor, between the owners and the workers. Um, and that there's this ideal, again, I'm, I'm an idealist, um, that uh, you know, when the worker is the owner, that all of these other synergies start to happen, um, that all these interests align and they're not competitive anymore. And of course, you see that in the extremes where um, you know, unions have served a, a, a necessary purpose in a lot of cases, but you also see the worst of that when you have a, a body divided against itself. You have the owners fighting at the expense of, of employees and employees doing things sometimes that even harm the company itself to try to you know, look out for their own interests. And, that's just such an um, unfortunate situation, I think. And so when you bring those things together, um, which I'd love to just see more in general in industry, um, it, beautiful things happen. So that was one of my favorite things we've done so far at Flocknote was launch our, our ESOP, our Employee Stock Ownership Plan. Um, and um, everyone in our team becomes an owner, a part owner of the company. And so last year was actually my favorite award. We give awards out in our, in our company every year. And the team got me my favorite award yet, which was um, co-owner of the year award. <laughs> and so I went from being the full owner to being a co-owner. And um, it was is my favorite award I've gotten yet because this whole journey we've been on just to, to be able to go on it fully together, you know, where we're sharing the burden of this, you know, it's a burden too. It's a responsibility that comes with ownership. Um, but of course you get the benefit of the fruits of all of that as well as, as you develop it. And so it's been really amazing to see our team um, just light up at that opportunity to become an owner, uh, a part owner, a co-owner of the company, 
but the way they the way they treat it now it's theirs you know and and we we're doing this together and it's just an amazing thing so i'm super excited about that and um and where that's taken us uh, some of your team have uh, one of the most innovative titles i've heard in a long time and that is they are happiness engineers that's right happiness what engineer. is a happiness engineer <laughs> So our happiness engineer is our version of, you know, customer support, um, but we see it as a role much bigger than just sort of solving some technical problem that somebody's having or a support question um, to fix an issue that a customer's having. Um, we really see ourselves um, and have become great partners with all the churches that we work with. And so a happiness engineer is there to, to look beyond just the technical problem they might be helping a customer with and really try to understand their goals what they're trying to achieve, um, to look for ways that, you know, maybe there's uh, things they're not taking advantage of that we could help them do better. Um, just through our experience working with, you know, 10,000 churches, um, you know, there's a lot of accumulated wisdom and best practices we've been able to, to share. And so just taking that opportunity to, to, to go deeper in the relationship with each person. So that just deserved a title more than just, you know, customer service. Uh, you know, this is a, a, a bigger vision for that relationship. When you have a job as a happiness engineer, uh, the t I mean, the title itself creates an expectation, right? And uh, do you do you have trouble sometimes? The customers have an expectation of the happiness engineers that is is unrealistic or impossible to meet. <laughs> um, I mean, every once in a while you get really grumpy people that you just can't make happy, but. Um, I don't know. Our happiness engineers are amazing. I mean, they just, they, they're the kind of people that they're really special people, but they, they take that. Like you get someone that's just having a terrible day. Maybe they're really angry. You get a lot of people in customer service that think the only way to get attention is to complain or escalate the issue or th make threats or you'll be angry. And so they're just used to that, you know? And so I love our, our happiness engineers take that as a chance to completely disarm them, I think, and, and be something very different than what they're used to hitting. And they find somebody. And I, I mean, 99.9% .9 of the time that person is won over by the end. And, um, we have incredible, you know, uh, um, you know, ratings in terms of our customer service because of that. But yeah, they're very special people in that, but it takes a certain personality that enjoys that and has the energy to do that um, and do it all day long. Yeah. Mm. So we think about this mission you have around communication. You think about the church whose primary mission is communication. Why are we so bad at it? <laughs> a good question um so you're right communication is intimately tied up to communion to um, community you know it doesn't you can't have communion and community without communication and i think that's at the heart of the crisis in the church today is is a breakdown in communication um, like i mentioned already i think that the there's so many people leave in the church it's many times maybe most of the time it just has not been communicated to them what they're leaving. And that's, that's on us. You know, I think that, that we need to figure out why that's not happening. Um, you know, I think some of the things at, at the core is, um, we've forgotten what's at stake and there's something big at stake, but it doesn't always feel that way. You know, when you walk into a church and the kinds of things we send out don't always feel like there's a lot at stake. And, um, and so I think people's commitment level, I think there's something human in us. We, we want to be challenged. We're willing people engage with all kinds of things. We see it everywhere, you know, when there's something big at stake. I mean, politics is like your perfect example of it. You see how engaged people get when they seem, they f believe something important is at stake. They will spend hours a day watching videos, forwarding things to their friends, showing up and protesting, getting out to the ballot boxes, giving their money, all those things when they think something important is at stake. And we have something huge at stake, way more at stake than what's at politics. And, um, but we, we haven't managed to, to convey that, you know? And I think that's at the heart of it is that we have to get back to reminding people that something big is at stake. And I think we've gotten scared of it because we think it's gonna push people away and, in, in, and along with that, you stop sort of talking about the demands of the faith and what it costs because you can't communicate the cost if there's nothing big at stake and it's not worth it, you know? So I'm not gonna 
I'm not going to give up or sacrifice a lot if there's nothing really that big at stake. Um, and so it really starts with understanding that um, there's something really meaningful in our work in the church. It's the most important thing in the world. And I think the other lesson that is the church really needs to learn is that it is our actions that communicate way more than what we say. And when you look at someone who's a Christian, what we communicate through our actions is way more powerful than what we're going to say to somebody, the right answer to a question, any of those kind of things. And I think that what's missing so often is um, the willingness to completely reorder our life around this important thing. Um, because when you see people who do that, that inspires people. When mm. you see someone who's willing to reorder their whole life around it, not just an hour on Sunday, not just some classes here or there, not just a prayer here or there out of tradition or habit, but that your whole life is reordered around that thing, that communicates something that gets people's attention. That communicates there's something big at stake. That communicates there's something worth sacrificing for. That gets my attention to say, you're strange. Tell me why you're acting so strangely, you know? And I think we're missing that a lot, you know? Um, not that we don't have inspiring individuals in the church. Um, I feel like somehow we've lost that um, posture as an institution. And I think partially because we've, we've gotten um, scared, you know, we've gotten insecure. We've, we feel like we don't want to share stuff as confidently because we don't want to scare people off. We don't want to talk about the demands because we feel like it's going to scare people off. We, and what we've ended up doing is just making it, well, I guess there's nothing that big at stake right there. It's great insight also. Let's talk about the book. <clears throat> Messy and Foolish. I read it when you first released it. Um, I read it again over the last week. Uh, incredibly impactful. What does it mean to be messy and foolish? Well, for me, I wrote the book at a time in my life where I was very passionate about the church. A lot of my friends leaving, my peers, you know, leaving the church. And just feeling like the maintenance mode of everything going on and um, was not going to change anybody's mind. Um, the status quo was not changing anybody's mind. Um, and then all of the energy that was spent toward it, I felt like was very um, insular. It was, it was within this group of people that all believed and thought alike and was not really, you know, breaking outside of that bubble very successfully. Um, and so it, it was just... In a lot of my work, a lot of my blogging at the time and things like that was very much that. It was within this audience. And I love this. It's my people, you know, and, and I love them. But when it comes to sort of these efforts to reach outside that, um, I just was really motivated to figure out, like, how do we how do we do that? And how do we fix some of these bigger problems in the church? And it was it was kind of a pep talk to myself, the book, you know, to, to kind of remind myself that, um, you know, some of the things I've been saying that that. Um, we need to be doing something worthy of dropping your nets and, and, and going, you know, um, we should look more like people in love. Um, I think, uh, with Elvis, the Elvis song that says, wise men say only fools rush in, but I can't help falling in love with you. Um, like, I feel like we should look more like fools rushing in. And, and we're not. And St. Paul says the, uh, the foolishness of God is wiser than men. Um, there's, a, there's a logic that transcends the world, the wisdom of the world, um, that God, that we, we don't understand, um, and that is about something much bigger than, than anything in this world and in this life. And our, our lives need to reflect that. Um, and so I think the mess part is, you know, we need to rethink how we're doing things now, you know, um, that what the status quo is, is not working. It's, it's in many ways working against us. And so we need to be really willing to rethink it. Um, and the foolishness is really tapping back into that um, just deeper wisdom that God gives us that the stuff that doesn't make sense to the world, you know, 
um, that death is a is a doorway to the next world, not something that we're supposed to just avoid at all costs forever. Um, that you know we're supposed to love our enemies, that we forgive people over and over and over and over again. Um, you know that that we care for the the least among us, the the most vulnerable, the tiniest um, people. I mean, all of those things that I think are the things that are most attractive about the church and that offer really the most appealing, valuable thing, you know, this, this, uh, way out of this world, you know, <laughs> that, that we've over, that Jesus has overcome death. Um, it just felt like it was missing from so much of, of what we talked about. Um, but again, I think a lot of what I realized through that work, because I, I came in, in my adulthood, as I sort of claimed the faith as my own, um, was very, being an engineer, I love the apologetics. I love the reasoning of the faith. It's beautiful and deep and rich. And so that was very attractive to me. And at that time, that's what I thought the answer was. You know, I just need to go explain this to everybody. Because if you explain it, how can you, it just makes sense, right? And that, like that worked for me at that point in my life, you know, the way it all came together, that was what I needed. Um, but we all talk past each other and nobody seems to agree that it's that straightforward when you look at it. Well, why is that? And so much of it is um, that the way we communicate things is so much more than just those words I'm saying. You know, it's, 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 have I earned their attention yet? Have I earned their respect yet? Have I earned their trust yet? Have I established myself as a, a stable and worthy place of, you know, getting important information from? Um, do I have a relationship with you where you even care to listen to me? I think that first step of even giving you the time of day, you know, starts with just loving people um, and not to some end so that you can, you know, tell them something, but just because you love them. And, and I think that emphasis on that part of it, I know for me was lacking and, um, you know, needed a, a pep talk. What are we afraid of? What, what, what is the fear that stops us? from sharing the good news, do you think? I think sometimes we feel like we need to have all the answers. And if we don't, that, you know, we can't engage in some of those topics, um, which I think is one of the wonderful things about our faith is that it's true. You don't have to know it all. I just need to show it to you. Um, I don't need to fully understand it. I can just share my experience of it. Um, so we shouldn't feel like we need to know all the answers or fully understand it because we never will. And, but that's, what's great about something true and good and beautiful is you just, you just show it to somebody, you share your experience of it and hopefully it moves them them closer to it. Um, but I think definitely a fear of looking silly, um, not knowing the answers. Um, I think a lot of us, too, and this was the case for me, is really focusing on me first. Um, and not in like a selfish way, but like fixing what's wrong with me. Because <laughs> I think when we start to do that, a lot of other things start to take care of themselves. We start to live a life that's more compelling. Um, that was uh, Chesterton's famous letter that they asked, what's wrong with the world? And he wrote in and said, dear sirs, I am. <laughs> Sincerely, G.K. Chesterton. Um, and I think that's a great reminder for all of us. And, uh, I think we, we get, it was easy. I became very zealous and I was like, I know all the right answers. I just need to tell everybody the right answers. And what I needed to do was become a saint myself. I needed to work on myself. I needed to sanctify myself. Um, I needed to grow a lot in how I was loving people and what that meant. And, um, you know, so I think if we realize that like, that's one of the main ways we're going to share the faith is filling ourselves up first. Um, and then we overflow from that, you know, mm. that, that it's the overflowing of our own hearts. I think that, that are going to sh change the world. Yeah. In the book, you quote, um, you quote C.S. Lewis. We are half hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. 
we are far too easily pleased. When you feel yourself becoming half-hearted in something, what do you do with that? Yeah, I love that quote because I think it's so relatable. I think everyone, when you read that, if you've ever struggled in the spiritual life, I think that resonates hugely because there's always this immediate gratification or this thing I know I can do now or my plan. And deep down, we know that it's not as good as what God wants to give us, but we just can't let go of it, you know, and but we have to let go of it in order to go on that holiday at the sea. Um, for me personally, it's, I have to find inspiration in places because it is, it's just, otherwise your mind will just continually forget it fades that impression when you you, know, you go on that you have that retreat experience you read that great book you have that great conversation you're very fired up and you can see the the long-term vision the the benefit the value of that holiday at the sea that you're going toward and you're motivated for that moment but then you know 10 steps down the the path you're back in the mud you know playing in the sand again so um, because it, you forget and so you really have to you have to find habits that are going to continually renew that and um, and keep you inspired and and continually form you in that way because certainly the world is going to continually try to keep grabbing you and pulling you down for that immediate gratification it's interesting because our culture talks about like settling and very often people are loud and aggressive about, oh, you shouldn't settle for that, or you shouldn't settle for that. Um, but one of the things that comes across in the book is that, you know, we settle in the thing that matters most. And we, we settle for not half measures or quarter measures, but like one one millionth of, um, of what God wants to give to us. And then I, th I think about your earlier comments about risk and the idea that it's never a choice between some risk and no risk. Um, how do you think that uh, people think about risk in relation to their faith? How do you think about people? Do you think people even think about settling in these ways? Yeah, it's a, I think it's a really great question because I think today one of the biggest sort of values the culture puts on there is options is that you want to have as many options as you can. And you want to always be able to choose a different option. And you end up in this life that is completely anxiety inducing because how do you choose, you know? Um, and I think that the point of life is not to endlessly have options or to never settle because if you never settle, what are you, what are you doing? You're always, looking for the next thing. And, and after a while, you learn that that never ends, you know? And I think that there's so much, and it's very alluring because there's so much in the world today, so many good things you can go and consume, media you can check out, things you can do, experiences, people you can meet, relationships you can build. There's endless good things and you can't do all of them, but we want to, and we want to think we can. And I think what it keeps you at this surface where you're sitting in front of all these doors and you're just gonna stay in the hallway and I wanna have all my options open, but that's not how you live life and you'll never live life that way. You'll be completely unsatisfied standing in the hallway forever. So it's good to have a few options, but at some point you have to decide and you gotta go and you gotta pick somewhere to go or pick somewhere to start digging. And I think that's what I think about a lot is like going deep into life in all the different aspects of life. And we think we need lots of experiences or we need to meet lots of people, but I think you learn more going deep with one relationship with a person than you'll learn meeting a thousand different people, you know, on the surface. And I think that's what we miss so much in life today. We think we need to be out there. We need to be, you know, have lots of followers or friends or fans or attention or be recognized by lots of people, all those substitutes for God that we pursue. Um, but it's all right in front of us already. You know, I think that um, you know, certainly God calls us on adventures in our life and we need to be open to that. But um, mostly it's all right in front of us. You know, you just the person sitting next to you is an inf infinitely deep place to go explore and digging for treasure. And I think we miss all that because we're too, we're too afraid of missing out on something up on the surface. And um, what we need to do is start digging. And uh, whether it's in our marriage or it's in our children or it's in a particular setting, or it's a one neighbor, or it's a neighborhood, you know, at some point, um, you know, you got to make a home, 
and 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 go deep in all those different ways. Well, the options are the enemy. The the endless options are the enemy of commitment, right? And and without commitment, there's no wholeheartedness. And so uh, people are living half-hearted lives, or living half-heartedly in many many aspects of their lives, but looking for the satisfaction, the fulfillment that can only come from living wholeheartedly. It's fascinating. When we talk about evangelization, um, or when people hear the word evangelization, um, they have many different thoughts that come through their minds, but most people don't think of their children. In the book you write, this is especially true in raising our children. We're not just equipping them to become faithful cogs in the industrial machine, safely navigating life's pitfalls. We're not just helping them to survive this life or even ultimately to succeed. We are here to teach our children to see the world differently, to discover a loving God who made us all to live big, beautiful, meaningful lives. It's, it's, it's very powerful um, statement. How do you, how do you see that manifesting in your daily interaction with your children? And, um, and what is the push and pull or the challenges of that? Yeah, I think for me, one of the big holes in the bucket in the church is that generational transmission of the faith. And I think if that's all we did and we did that well, the church would be doing amazing, yeah. you know, and too often we kind of look past them and say, oh, I need to go s save this person or change this person's mind or evangelize this group. But if all we did was that, it would, we would be doing amazing. And, um, and those are the ones we're most responsible for, you know, and the, the ones we've most been put in a place to impact and the ones that God said here, I need you to do this for me, you know, like in the most direct possible way he could. So I think I take that very seriously. Um, and I'm willing to do whatever it takes, anything, if it meant changing careers, changing places we live, changing whatever, if it means that it increases the likelihood that my children will receive the faith um, genuinely, you know. It's really, I think, prioritizing it and then reordering your life all the way around it, which as it happens, like that's one of the key things to passing it on to them is that when they see that you as your as their parents, the people that are responsible for their existence and who hopefully have a good relationship with them, have reordered your entire life around living the faith, then they tend to do that too. Mm. It's one of the most consistent factors there. Of, of whether or not the faith gets passed on. And, you know, I think that we have to be willing to do that in order for them. In the book, um, and you mentioned it there in that quote, but you, you talk significantly about um, seeing the world differently. Mm. Um, what do you mean and why does it matter? Yeah, I think at that time, especially, that was helpful for me um, to kind of capture what I was what was I trying to do in these different interactions with people? Um, and I think why we talk past each other so much is because if you just see the world two totally different ways, then you just kind of have a non-starting point. Um, and I think there's lots of ways you can analyze Christianity. It makes no sense and seems absurd. But if you, if you kind of are open to seeing it from its own perspective, you know, of why it, it, it says, why it teaches these things and why this happened this way and um, why we believe what we believe, all of a sudden it makes perfect sense, you know? And so, so much of it, I think, is a shift in, it's not winning these individual battles on particular doctrinal points. Um, it's really helping them shift and see the world very differently. Um, and so, you know, I think some of the things that inspire, that's what a little bit I talk about in the book of things that inspire people to go, whoa, maybe I should think about life differently is when you meet someone that's different, that's radically different, you know, that's doing something that gets your attention and sort of shocks you out of your normal, that, that person is not like other people. Why is that? They seem happy. They seem whatever it is, it's attractive, but there's something different and that opens you up, you know? And I think, um, 
that's kind of a fundamental first step, I think, in our culture is that we need to figure out how we're seeing things differently, find common ground beyond that, and then work back or, or I think in most cases, um, earn the right for them to, to ask them to look at it differently. Because right now you ask them and they say, I already know I'm not, I'm not interested in looking at it that way. I already know the answer. I know you're wrong. Um, the way you win that over is through friendship, through relationships, through loving each other, through sacrificing uh, for each other, um, through radically loving them, you know, and those kind of things shock people out of their complacency or sort of assumptions about you or life or the way they see life um, and opens them up to maybe, maybe look at it a little differently because once you make that shift, everything can fall in line, you know, but in our culture now where it's such a focus on, you know, self, um, determination of like my life and what I decide what's who I am and, and what I am and, and, uh, what's important to me and what's true and what's valuable in life. Like, I mean, that's a totally different way of looking at the world than the Christian point of view, you know? And I think, um, there's a, that's a lot of the reasons we talk past each other. Yeah. I'm struck by the phrase, earn the right. Hmm. And, uh, it, I mean, the phrase itself is radically countercultural. Um, hmm. And I have heard you speak uh, previously um, in answer to a question like, if you have an email list, how often should you email the list? And I've heard you speak in that context also about earning the right to email the list. Hmm. Talk a little bit about that. Sure. Yeah. I mean, that's a lesson we learned very directly at Flocknote, helping churches manage email lists and text message lists. And, um, you know, we try to help them improve open rates and especially something like texting, sending someone a text message. Um, at first, churches were very, and they should be, uh, careful with it because they said, well, that seems intrusive. That seems disruptive. Um, they're not expecting to get texts from me, all those things. And that's true, maybe. So, um, so much of uh, what we get, and again, this comes from the question of how often should I send something? Well, what have you earned the right to send them? So like a spammer has earned you know, zero right to send me anything, <laughs> right? Uh, but my mom, she can call me every five minutes if she wants, you know, she's earned that right um, and, and everything in between. And so I think that it, it depends on the context of what's happening in your relationship with that person. As I apply that, apply that to, um, evangelization. Like it, it was helpful. It was a helpful concept for me because you, you have a friend or you know somebody and you know they're maybe they're living their life in a way that's not, not good, not consistent with the faith, whatever. And your immediate instinct is, you know, I need to tell this person that they're wrong. Right. And I've seen it go, I've seen it be so ineffective so many times, you know, you got to step back and say, well, what, when is it okay to do this? When is it not? And I know people that are like, no, you just tell them and you've done your job. And that's it. Yeah. Um, and I just think, you know, okay, maybe, but if you really want to help the person, you know, I think there's, there's a journey you go on with that person where you earn the right to talk to them about that issue. And, and so certain friendships, you'll have earned that right to have that conversation. And some, maybe you haven't yet. Um, and I think people, I think people understand that concept, you know, when you're, whatever your relationship is, like, you kind of earn the right to talk to people or address certain issues at certain levels. And um, I think that's a really important evangelization lesson if we want to be effective. So that requires um, patience. It requires persistence. It requires um, real intentionality around friendship, relationship. Um, all of these virtues uh, seem in uh, short supply in our modern culture. Um, how do we encourage people to grow in virtue, even if maybe they're not that interested in their faith? I, I love the focus on virtues. It's a beautiful way to think about becoming a saint, right? Just being the ultimate virtuous person is a saint. And um, you know, we talk about that a lot within our culture at Flocknote, we have a culture of growing in virtue and helping each other grow in virtue. 
and virtue is just a habit. It's a good, a good habit, a disposition to do something good. Um, so it's a wonderful in, I think, with people that you're not speaking religiously. It's, it is a, a shared experience of something that is an objective good that they may not recognize it as an objective good. Um, but we would say, is it better to be patient or impatient? You know, and they say, it was better to be patient. Well, if you help someone become more patient, you've helped them become more Catholic, more Christian. Um, and so I think there's lots of ways of looking at evangelization along all those other layers where if you're helping people grow in virtue, they're, they're going to, they're taking steps in the right direction. And it can be a wonderful way in with people. If it's something that's, all these things are also very practical, right? So people see the value of being more patient, right? As an example, um, they see the value of being truthful. Um, so those things are, most people can agree on that part. It can be a good starting point, especially in a culture where we don't often agree on some of those starting points. Mm. So we live in an age where we have uh, more possibility of communicating than ever before. Um, and the church's mission um, to evangelize obviously can be enhanced by these uh, modern technologies and communication. Um, how do you see them being used well to evangelize and how do you see them being used poorly to evangelize? So I think the ones that are using it well have something, a big vision. They have something meaningful that they're doing. I stress this a lot with folks because you can get distracted by a little, a lot of the marketing techniques. Well, if you, if you send it at this time of day or you do it this way, or you put an image here, or you do this and those things can be helpful and they'll magnify what you're doing. They can, they can definitely help. But if at the end of the day, you're not doing something meaningful, it doesn't matter, you know? And I think that's what we see in a lot of churches. You can have people put together very professional looking newsletters, emails, and, and beautiful communications. It's branded perfectly. There's, you know, it's written well, all those things. And still nobody cares yeah. because they're not doing something meaningful. And then on the other side, you can see people that have almost no skill at doing those things, but yet people are flocking to them and saying, I want to go where you're going. Yes. And, and so that is a really important distinction, I think, that we can help them with some of those technical skills and that's going to make you better at what you're doing. But it's in the noise if you don't have something meaningful that you're trying to do. And that's the big difference I see with a lot of churches communicating. When, when you have something big and exciting and meaningful that people want to get behind and they have a leader that they believe can take them there, you know, phew, I mean, everything else is, is just going to magnify that, that you can do in terms of improving your communication techniques. In the book, you talk about uh, generational shifts. Um, we're seeing them play out in the church now, younger generations leaving sooner and sooner. And a big part of the faithful population um, are leaving this earth and going into that next adventure. Um, in the book you wrote, my parents' generation left the church without leaving the pews. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I think if I looked at a lot of my peers who were leaving the church, um, it was apparent that they didn't have lives where their family had reordered things around the faith that there wasn't, um, I'm not gonna say they didn't believe, but they didn't, it wasn't as important as a lot of other things. And um, I think, you know, when you look at the studies too, of a lot of those people that are in the pews that I say left the church in the sense that they didn't really believe what the church is anymore in a lot of ways. Some of the core beliefs of the church, they just don't hold. And they've kind of, co-opted the church to be something else for them, whether it's, you know, just part of their tradition or a cultural thing or, you know, a vehicle for some sort of social, you know, justice or whatever that, you know, they, they believe in. It aligned with that, but the rest of it, they kind of said, no, I don't need that anymore. And I think their kids knew that. Mm -hmm. I think that was obvious. I think it was obvious that, you know, to their kids that this wasn't something that you, um, reordered your whole life around and um, for its own sake, not to achieve some other end in, in the culture. Um, 
I think also that generation wasn't catechized that well. And so like um, uh, where they, they didn't necessarily know a lot of the good responses to the questions the culture was asking. Um, and so they felt ill-equipped, I think, to be able to help their children through those things. And they ended up kind of just going with the culture as well with a lot of those challenges. And I think it just slowly eroded their confidence in their faith. And so their, you know, their kids grow up to be adults and they're like, what's at stake here? Why, why should I bother with all of this, especially when it's really culturally unpopular? Um, so, I mean, I, I think that was already happening, you know, when they were in the pews as a kid. Mm. For someone who's watching and hearing you talk about the idea of reordering your faith or reordering your life, um, around the faith, um, but they don't know what to do or where to start or what sort of starting point would you recommend for them? Yeah, the church gives us some good tools for that, I think. So, um, so our family, certainly Sunday mass, that's a good start if you're not that. So that's a good sort of minimal weekly rhythm. Um, but it has to also, that Sunday mass needs to be a priority. It's not something you try to squeeze in before your favorite NFL game or, you know, the big party we're really going to for the day. It's, it's the, it's the highlight of the day. Uh, and so if you don't feel that excited about it, you know, that's okay, but you probably need to learn more about it and understand what's going on there and why it's important, why it should be central so that it can be a big part of your day. I think, I think a lot of it naturally happens when you really internalize it yourself. So again, I think it goes back to really looking at yourself and saying, do I really believe this stuff? Mm. If I really believe this, what does that mean for my life? Um, but I think then it overflows into other places, you know, because now you're starting your day with the reading. So, I mean, our, we, now we homeschool as well, which we really love the flexibility it gives us to reorder our life around the faith. Um, so their education is ordered around the faith. Um, our daily rhythm and schedule is ordered around the faith. You know, we can start the day together and do the daily readings together as a family. We can dictate that schedule ourselves. Um, um, certainly getting involved in other kinds of things around the parish, you know, that are important, that it's not just a place you go every Sunday, you know, um, you know, going to confession regularly as a family, um, just being up there with this adoration or being participating in other things that that's more important than my baseball game. Um, that's more important than some work project I really want to work on. Um, so I think if we look at our lives and we're not willing to choose, you know, something that's important to the faith versus, you know, a baseball game being on TV, then we need to kind of look at ourselves and, and maybe re reorder that. Mm. You also say in the book, we've fallen in love with knowing we are right and called it loving our neighbor. Incredibly powerful line. There's just so many of them in the book. Um, Talk to us about that one. Yeah, I think this was primarily whenever I see people, and they call it tough love, um, that, no, it's just tough love. They need tough love. They need to hear that they're wrong about something. And to me, that's not tough love, just telling people they're wrong and winning an argument. You know, like I can prove that I'm right because I'm, I, I've done my study and I, you know, I know the right answer. Um, I'm more concerned. And again, this is speaking to myself at that time too, where you have a tendency. It's like, you want to be right. You want to win the debate. You want to, you want to be the one that knew the right answer. Um, but that's not really what it's about. You know, this is a journey we're on together as brothers or sisters. And um, I think, you know, tough love is being willing to, to get in the trenches with that person and take on their burdens and troubles as your own. Like to me, when, when God says, love your neighbor as yourself, it's not just, you know, having good feeling towards them, you know, when you see them and wishing them well, um, it's, you find out your neighbor has a problem and you're like, oh, I could help with that. It means I can't make my poker night, but this is more important that I'm going to go over there and spend my Saturday there instead. You know, I'm taking on my neighbor's burden as myself. I'm that their troubles become mine. And when you have that 
sort of approach is that's going alongside somebody and saying, I'm in this with you. I'm not here to defeat you in a debate. Um, I'm in this thing with you. I want to come alongside you. I want to understand why you believe what you believe so that we can get to the truth together, not so I can prove that I'm right. Talk about making this journey together. And um, you mentioned earlier that uh, when you're at Lockheed Martin and you, you had this vision of um, serving the church in this way, um, your wife encouraged you to leave your job and... Um, and she's your partner in this journey. Um, how important is that decision? And, and what advice would you have for single people about who they choose to journey with uh, in that way? It's a good question. I think, you know, for us, we were able to talk about a lot of important things before we got married, which is great. I think one of the most important skill sets today that a lot of people never really learn is, is how to make a good home. And I think that's a great place to start with somebody before you get married is what kind of home do you want? Um, and this goes into even choosing what career you want. Is your career compatible with the kind of home that you want to have? Is your skill set that you're trying to go get so you can support your family compatible with the kind of home and lifestyle that you want to have with your family and your children? But getting on the same page with your spouse about those things is really important before you get married. Um, and of course, it's an evolving journey you go on together. Um, and it's part of the adventure. Um, I think I was really fortunate with my wife too. We were able to go, so she was not Catholic when we met. And um, over time, she became interested in it. And um, she ended up becoming Catholic before we got married because that was something really important to me and for us to, have, to share that faith before we got married to make sure that that was something we shared in common for our family because it was so essential to reordering our life around it. So pretty important for us to agree on it. Um, so we were fortunate to go on that journey before we got married and she went through the RCIA process and we were able to go through that together, um, which was a great blessing. We had a great mm. RCIA teacher and it wasn't me teaching her the faith or telling her what I think, but for us to go on that journey together and hear someone else explain it and teach it to us was really helpful. So I would recommend doing some of the things like that, where you get to explore your faith and your beliefs, especially if you differ in some of those things, um, you know, doing something like that together where there's a third party, you know, sort of sharing something with you and you can both, you know, reflect on it and grow through it um, was really helpful process for us and a beautiful journey. So it created a really powerful, strong foundation for our marriage um, because we had already thought through a lot of those things. We had wrestled with a lot of those questions and, um, you know, knew what we wanted generally as much as you could at that time uh, when we got married. What was something that you thought you wanted back then that uh, you realized you didn't want? Or what is something you thought was important back then that isn't important anymore? Or how has your perception changed um, through the years of marriage and having six children and, and growing this business and serving the church in this way? I think I've, I've grown in desire for simplicity and realizing that you don't have to do a lot of things to have a really full life. Um, that if you are willing to go deep in the few things that you have, um, there's a lot of treasure there, more than you can ever discover. Mm. And there's a temptation, I struggled with this for a long time, and it's the whole social media struggle as well, um, where this, you, you, there's this fear of missing out. There's all these things going on. Um, but that ability to say no to something so that you can fully say yes to something else is a really important distinction because you feel like you can say yes to everything and you don't want to say no to anything. But every yes you say to something here is a no to something else. You just don't, you won't face it. You won't admit it. And what happens is you don't get around to it or you don't, go, you know, appreciate it or do it as deeply as you could. Um, but you are saying no to something else. And we just don't have the courage to, to admit it sometimes. And I think recognizing that you don't have to have everything. You don't, everyone doesn't have to know who you are. You don't have to have this huge sort of impact, which again, I think for my generation too, social media coming of age as social media, you know, became so popular there was such an emphasis on people knowing about what you're doing. It's like if people didn't know that it happened, then it didn't happen. You know, mm. if it's not documented somewhere where people could 
like it and, 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 uh, you know, share it or whatever, then it doesn't exist, which is such an unhealthy way to live. But I think it's just normal for us now, even if we don't think we think that way. I think when we look at our behaviors, a lot of times that's how we actually are valuing things is based on whether they can be shared or whether somebody else knows about it. Um, and so that's what I've loved about completely getting off of all of the social media stuff, because you realize that you can breathe again and the light and that life isn't nearly as overwhelming as it, as it may feel sometimes that you can, God's given you enough time and energy and everything you need to do exactly what he wants you to do today. And you don't have to worry about all that. You know, you just need to discern what it is and do it. Yeah. One of my favorite um, passages in the scriptures is uh, after Joseph and Mary take um, Jesus to the temple and, um, and Simeon prophesies about um, Jesus and who he is and um, what he will mean to humanity and to the world. Um, and then the passage just ends with this phrase. Um, it's just sort of there and it, um, the phrase is, and, and Mary pondered all these things in her heart, you know, and I think about how different our approach is to things like that in a social media world. There are very few things that we we ponder in our heart um, and 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 we hold for ourselves before we release them into the world. Mm -hmm. um, and so does the social media world present unique challenges to the gospel, and how do we need to think about that? Yeah, I think it certainly does. Um... I think that the, um, what you said, that immediate, instead of pondering something ourselves, is what the comment section does on every place, right? I'm gonna scroll to the comment and, and let them tell me what this means. Yeah. Is this a big deal? Is it not a big deal? Is this person right? Or are they totally wrong, right? Like I'm gonna go and find out what other people think first before I go through the process of making my own mind up, which is okay to get other people's opinions, but I think it, we skip past that really quickly. We can't even avoid it. You don't even have a chance to ponder it in your heart before somebody else is telling you what to think about it. And already with the way it's presented, it's usually already telling you what to think about it. So I think it's terrible for that. I mean, I think in general, social media and the, the news media in general are just a, a very terrible lens to try to figure out what's real and important and what matters in life. I think that like if you, you know, if you spend a lot of time there, you will not have a very good grip on what is real and what's important. Um, because the things that they tell you are important and the things that they tell you are real and the things that they tell you matter and that you need to think about and have an opinion about, most of it's completely garbage, complete bonkers. I mean, it's just because some celebrity comes out and says that this is the way something is. Now we have to all agree that this is a big deal or that I need to have a position on this issue or that I need to have an opinion about this thing. It's such a complete waste of our minds. And instead they should be focusing on the things right around us and our families. And what am I gonna do to surprise my wife tonight? And what am I gonna do to you know, engage my son about his day when I get home or whatever the case may be. But instead we're thinking about all this other garbage that completely doesn't matter. And if you, that's when something about getting off of social media that I've learned over time is like, you get enough distance from it and you can see how much 99% of it doesn't matter the next day, mm. much less a week or a month or a year later. And so there's some room for like, we want to know what's happening now, but it should be a much smaller percentage, I think, of the type of information we're consuming, you know, and really be, we should be spending much more time in things that are, that transcend the, the news of today or what matters this week. As a saying in journalism, um, opinions are cheap, truth is expensive. Uh, we see this in our hyper opinionated um, society. Um, as a result of that, social media now is competing with 
legitimate news or vice versa, legitimate news outlets are being forced to compete with um, entertainment outlets and opinion outlets. What does that mean for the future of truth and objectivity in journalism, do you think? I mean, I think it means we shouldn't trust a lot of it. Um, I don't know what that means long term. I mean, of course, there's always been bias in, you know, whatever the history is being written or whatever, you know, so, but I, you would think that now um, you'd have more access to more information that we would, you know, have a, a better, clearer picture of something, but that's not always the case that more data doesn't mean a clearer picture. And I think what it what it lends itself to is people manipulating it to create the narrative that they want. And I think what's important with all this media is to remember that like the system that it's operating within, what is it designed to do? Because it's going to have its own bias. And so the system that it's operating in right now is to sell ads, almost all of it, news media, social media, it's to sell advertisements. And so to do that, they need you to stay longer. They need you to care more about it. They need you to be more emotional about it. And they need you to scroll and like need to find out the next thing. So that's just built into it. It's designed to do exactly that. And that's what it does. So when you approach it, it is what it is. I mean, we can't, in some element, we need the news to know what's going on, but you have to know, you have to view it through the right lens and understand that that's what it's designed to do, that it's going to make things more sensational than they really are. It's going to make the world seem a lot more divided than it probably really is. Um, it's going to exaggerate extremes. That's what it does. Um, it's going to put us at odds with each other. And I think, again, that why some of the social media dynamics are so unhealthy is because you immediately go and, you know, dehumanize the other side to the point that they're just this, you know, somebody that's obviously evil. And um, when you get to that point, you know, you're not, this isn't reality. This isn't real. Um, so I think we have to be very careful with how much we put into that. Um, how much we think it really matters really in the course of things. I think uh, it's important to be, you know, informed, uh, but to what extent, like wh how much can I help it? If it's a particular cause that you're really passionate about and you've been called to work in that cause, um, this gets back to gladiator even, you know, it, it, so much of it now is, is mob rule. We feel like we have to participate because we want our vote as one of the members of the mob. Yeah. So if I'm not out there being representative of one of the opinions in the mob, then I don't get my voice. And I think that's a bit of an illusion, although there is some real power to that. But I think the way you take that power back is by opting out of the mob, not by participating in it further. Um, but certainly voting, certainly act, you know, getting active and doing something about it is important. I think sitting back on your keyboard and, you know, hashtagging and sharing it should be a much smaller percentage of, you know, what we see as our activism. Mm. You say in the book, saints spread the faith like wildfire because they are willing to catch themselves on fire first. What do you mean? It goes back to what we were saying that you have to you have to evangelize from the overflowing of your own heart that when you catch yourself on fire, you look crazy. It looks foolish. Um, not literally here, obviously, but you've done something in your life to the extent that people are like, what, what are you doing? You know, and when you look at someone like Mother Teresa, right? I mean, she goes to the slums of India and that's something that gets people's attention, you know? And she lived the life and she didn't know how to, you know, get her brand marketed properly or, you know, get her logo right or, you know, write an email or all those kinds of things. But it spread like wildfire, yeah. wildfire, because it was real and authentic and it was actually a fire. <laughs> and so if it's actually on fire, then it spreads. Mm. Um, so. I think that's too often we're trying to push, you know, something that's just not, and we're trying to catch things on fire with stuff that's not even on fire itself yet. And we wonder why it's not working. Who are some of your heroes? So I'm a big, uh, I mean, I love books. So authors are always some of the first I go to. Um, I'm a big Peter Kraft fan. 
could read every one of his books, although it's going to take me a while because he has like over 80 of them. But I've read I've read a lot of them. Um, G.K. Chesterton, Lewis, all those guys I love. Um, I'm a big fan of Bishop Barron, um, big fan of Matthew Kelly, guy I've read a few of his books. Um, definitely changed my life in a lot of ways throughout the years, um, both in my faith, in my business, in our work at Flocknote, all those things. So thank you for that. You're welcome. Um, so yeah, I love books. Those are all my favorite. In terms of real life, I mean my, uh, or not real life, but people I know, um, my wife for sure. Um, she inspires me every day with her love and devotion to our family and her, her, um, you know, radical sacrifices for us. And, um, you know, my parents, my grandfather was always inspiring to me. He actually became a Catholic priest, um, after having a bunch of children. Um, but after his wife died, he was a late vocation, um, New Zealander, um, really had a heart for the Maori people there and, uh, spoke Maori fluent fluently. And, um, so he was, he was called to vocation to be a priest for a Maori parish there. And that was always really inspiring to me. He was always kind of a, a spiritual, you know, guru I looked up to. He was always loved reading and, um, quotes and poetry and all of those good things. Um, yeah. Wow. That's a rich collection. <laughs> You close out the book talking about freedom and, and raising the question, um, are we really free in a, in a society where people seem so adamant about their freedom, um, and so loud about their freedoms? Um, we seem not to ask the question that you, you raise in the book, and that is, are we really free? What are your reflections on that? I think the what most people think of freedom is not really freedom. I think most people think freedom is I can do what I want. But of course, if only you can do what you want, then you're actually just a slave to your wants. And um, so freedom is not being able to do what you want. It's being able to say no to what you want. So if you can say no to what you want, it, now you're free to say yes to what you should. And uh, it's funny, we have this, it's something I've learned a lot with parenting too, because kids, it's just a natural human thing. It's like, well, I don't want to do that. Hey, I need you to clean up those toys. I don't want to do that. <laughs> and so they're constantly learning. It's like a foreign concept to them that if I don't want to do it, I can't do it, you know? And, and I tell them all the time, I'm saying, well, you don't have to want to do it. You just have to do it. <laughs> you're making this too, too confusing. You don't, you're putting too much pressure on yourself to think that you have to want to do it. You just have to do it. Um, but it is a challenge, you know, like they don't get it at first. It's, it's a, it's a hard concept, but it's one of the things for me and my kids, I focus on a lot. I'm like, one of the things I really want you to learn before you, you know, leave our house is how to say no to what you want, because it would be the worst thing for me as a parent to send you out in the world. And all you know how to do is what you want mm. because you will get in all kinds of trouble and your life will not be happy. And I just think that's so core to, it's just such a starting principle for doing the right thing in the world um, is that ability to say no to what you want so that you can do what you should. But yet every, all of our emphasis on personal freedoms is totally opposite that, you know? So I think that's a real problem. And probably why we live more and more in an age of slavery. Hmm. It's a great conclusion. Thank you so much for the conversation. Thanks for coming to visit us. I hope we can do it again soon. I'd love to. Thanks for having me, Matthew. You're very welcome.